Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you at this time asking for help, dear God. For there are some things we still don't see. There are some things we still don't perceive. There are some things that we're still blind to. And dear God, we pray for this opening of our eyes daily. Draw us to you as we draw near to you. Dear God, fill us today, I pray. Amen. Amen. Today I want to talk on the topic, Open My Eyes, Lord. Sometimes my wife accuses me of not seeing something that's right in front of me. <laughs> and we all probably have gone through this. Uh, you just don't see something in front of you. It's, you're all phased. It's like that wasn't your focus at the time. And so sometimes I myself get so, so narrow-minded. I only look at one thing because that's all I'm interested in. But there's so many other things around it. And I always get accused you didn't see that, but you right pass right by it. Especially if I'm driving, but well, I'm just focused on the road. I'm not focused on what the buildings that I pass by, but I should have seen it, right? <laughs> well, we've been in church, we've been Christians for a mighty long time for some of us. And I'm going to share some of, a little of my experience after being in church for such a while, and I still would tell you there was a time where I thought I was blind. All right? So I'm going to share that little part of me in today's sermon. But the other thing I want to do, and I want you to understand what I do now, is that I hate or I've disliked now because it's a practice I used to do when I wasn't able to see, all right? When I was a blind preacher, I'm going to call myself that, I preached differently than I do now. Because back then, I could have taken one scripture, and man, I could talk about it, and then all you left was that one scripture. And sometimes I feel like I've done people disservice. And so bear with me. I like to incorporate a little Bible study into the sermon. All right? And then on top of that, I'm just not going to give you one verse of scripture throughout. I want you to get the context. So I will give you the entire thing. I, it's one thing for me to tell you the context, but it's another thing if you can see the context for yourself. All right? So bear with me. There'll be lots of scripture. There'll be some talking. All right? And... God's Spirit will lead us today to truth. Um, first thing I want to do is, is give you some instances in the Bible of people who couldn't see what was right in front of them. And for various reasons. All right? Uh, one of them is... That God has provisions for you. Everything is right there for you. But sometimes you can't see it. So with this now, let's go to Genesis 21 verses 14. We'll go all the way down to 19. So it says here, early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. So what's happening here? is that Hagar is told she needs to leave the camp. All right? There's conflict going on there between Hagar and Sarah, Abraham's wife. Conflict because now both women have kids. All right? Abraham is the father of both kids. And there's conflict in the home. And so it's decided Hagar's got to leave. All right? And so that's the context there. But let's read on. It says, he set them on her shoulders. That's the food and the water. And then sent her off with the boy. That's Ishmael. 
She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. It continues. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. The well wasn't dug right after. That well was there all the time. But in her sorrow, in seeing the symptoms of death on her son's face, those symptoms became her focus, and she couldn't see what was right next to her. And so what I want you to understand now is that God would have you in certain situations and experiences. And you may feel this is my lot in life. This is all I got to work on. All right? All I see is problems. All I see is heartaches. I may even see death in front of me. But sometimes God's provisions are right there to take care of it. And you don't utilize it. God had to open her eyes and show her that he's still taking care of her. He's still going to take care of that boy. He's still going to fulfill that promise that he made before that time. That that boy would be a great nation. And so if God has promised you something, don't focus on the bad things. The things that lead to an end. Focus on what he's told you, because those things lead to eternity. So focus on the eternal things. God will take care of the rest that you experience here in this world. There's another situation, and this involves Balaam. You remember Balaam was that prophet? And he was told to go curse the nation of Israel in exchange for, for money. All right, for possessions. And so he looked upon both things. Well, I may try to, to curse God's people, but really, those people are blessed. So no matter what curse I give on them, it's like, it's not going to work. And so that's his, in his mind, that's what he's thinking. And he's like, well, I might as well get paid for doing nothing. All right? <laughs> so... Uh, with that mindset now, here he is, in Numbers 22, 29 to 31. Balaam answered the donkey. So now the donkey starts to talk. Because the situation here is that he is past, he's going with his donkey, and now he meets two pillars. And the pathway becomes so narrow, and the donkey isn't going straight. And so what happens? He bruises his legs on the con well, not concrete, on the pillars, all right? It's the stone. And he gets angry. He gets angry with the donkey. And so he beat the donkey. Not knowing that that donkey was there to protect him and to give him directions. Because here's the thing. When we read the text, this is what, what I want you to understand. Sometimes we look for God to give us a direction. This is what we should do. But what if God directs us in the opposite? This is what you should not do. That is still direction. And God's word is filled with so many things of what we should not do. It's true it's not written for Ypsilanti Church in today's environment. But we can get direction still from God's word. And so bear that in mind when we read. 
Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, As I, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opens Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Balaam didn't realize that the donkey was, di was getting directions from God. Whereas Balaam was not getting directions from God, the donkey was. And so from an unforeseen occurrence, the donkey is the one who's going to lead uh, Balaam to see God's angels. God opened his eyes because of that donkey. And so I want you to understand that sometimes God may be blocking your path from going a certain direction. You know, you want to do this career-wise, uh, relationship-wise, uh, financial investment-wise. And so you understand, somewhere there's a roadblock in the path. And what you do, you try to go around it because, no, this is what I want. This is what I think I need to do. This is the advice somebody else gave me. And God is trying to, to prevent you from going that path. Some of us, we still go, and God forgives us. But our, our life may have been so much different if we did not go that path. All right? And so God had to open Balaam's eyes to see that directions come from him and him alone. Sometimes we need protection, right? And it's so hard for us sometimes to realize that God's presence is right here next with us. And God's angels are always surrounding us. So there's another situation. In 2 Kings verse 6, no, chapter 6. And we'll do 11 through 17. And here we'll see God is, has his angels protecting us. And the situation here now is that the, the, the king of Syria... All right? He's making plans to destroy Israel. But Elisha the prophet tells the king of Israel what the plans for the king of Syria has to destroy. So it's like the inside information, all battle tactics are being revealed to the king of Israel as to what the king of Syria, whose name is Aram, is deciding. So every time there's a plot... Elisha sends news to the king of Israel, saying, this is what Syria is going to do. All right? And so with that in mind, let's read on. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? The Syrian king thought uh, somebody was squealing on him. All right? There was a mole in the camp. All right? Some espionage. Treason was going on. And so one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha. It's none of us. There's no moles in, in the camp of Syria. But there's somebody called Elisha. He's a prophet who's in Israel, and he tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. It was told him, Behold, he's in Dothan. So he sent there horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And so when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So now the servant gets worried. He said, Don't be afraid, for those with us, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 
Then Elisha prayed, O Lord, please open his eyes, that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The servant became worried. There's a big army. And the Syrian army probably uh, was larger than the Israelite army. Because then why be afraid if it's not? And why be afraid when Elisha already knew that how they were coming? And Elisha probably told the Israelite king they're coming. And they're probably coming for me. All right? Got to remember, Elisha was this prophet who spoke with God and God told him everything. And if God told him the battle plans for Syria, then I'm sure God would have told him, hey, they're coming for you. All right? And so Elisha remained calm through it all. The only person who was worried was the servant because the servant didn't see what Elisha was seeing. And so it brings us to this point now in our relationship with God. Uh, we know God is for us. He's taking care of us. But do we get worried sometimes when the bad situation comes? Or do our nerves start acting up on us again and we start to worry? We shouldn't. If only God would open our eyes at that time. But it, it can be open if we always bear in mind... I have the understanding. God is with me. The angels are with me. There's nothing to be afraid. Yeah, my sight is limited because I can't see everything around me that's in the spiritual realm of this life. But it's happening together with the physical realm. And so God is able to open our eyes at, or at least open our understanding. I'll tell you, I don't see angels. All right? But I know they're there. And I'm confident that I'm taken care of wherever I go. And so that's all I need to know. I know they're there because of the experiences I've had in life. And so I don't worry about it anymore. Yeah, every now and then my nerves do act upon me. All right? And I get a little stressed out. But give me a night's rest. And somehow my body resets in the morning time or somewhere in the night time I wake up and then I'm confident. It'll be all right. Tomorrow is a new day. I look forward to new resources from God again. Yeah. There was another situation where God had to open some people's eyes. And it just so happened it was the disciples this time. You see what happened? Jesus had died. And he had rose, and during the 40 days, he was walking with, 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 sometimes with the disciples, sometimes with other people, and I'm sure he was with people that were not even recorded in the Gospels. So for those 40 days, he didn't spend time alone with the disciples. He was back and forth during, doing other things. All right? And so at one point in time, he's walking with the disciples, and they don't know that it's him. All right? And let's look at Luke 24, verse 28 to 32. And so as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. And so they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Typical of Jesus, right? Stranger comes in with you because you don't recognize it's Jesus. And he starts to serve the meal. I mean, we don't see that happening. But to Jesus, that was always his practice. All right, so he just went along as normal Jesus behavior. He was always a servant to them. And so then their eyes were open when they saw this because then they realized what was happening and they recognized him. It was only on the act of serving that meal that they realized it was Jesus. And he disappeared from their sight. And so they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road 
and open the scriptures to us. So you notice it wasn't, it wasn't just a stranger conversation taking place before. He was talking scripture to them. He was comforting them. They were worried. They, they, in their mind at that time, they were leaderless. All right? And so he's assuring them. And at the same time assuring them, they didn't recognize it was him. Not until the meal did they realize that Jesus was with them. And so I want you to know that in my life, I've taken my relationship with Jesus a little step beyond what I used to. It's personal to me, and I take it a little serious, more serious than I did before. Okay? Um, because there was a time when that wasn't so. I shared with you some time ago that I uh, became a leader in, the, in my church, home church, when I was 14. That landed me on the church board. And so by about 15, 16, I was an elder already. All right? And with that, we were required because we all pastors back then had about five to seven churches. And so probably once a month, you'll either see the pastor on a Sabbath or on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night because we had Sunday night and Wednesday night services back then. So it means that all the elders spoke uh, at least one Sabbath and one night service or two night services for the month. All right? And I guess they, they saw something in me. And I'll tell you some of the things that, that happened. Um, but I'll tell you, as an elder that young and some of the problems I was seeing within the church as, le as a leader, it got to me. And it seems as though my relationship was in a daze with God. All right? Yes, I believe some things, but it wasn't getting deeper than it was. I had a shallow relationship with God back then. Okay? And so uh, there are some things that brought me to my knees, and I, so I, I'm going to share those texts with you in a while. But I'll tell you what, why I was in a daze. You see, back then, and I haven't shared uh, most of this story with you guys because probably I think it would have, it, it would have put me personally into, into problems because back then it did. And let me, let me explain what I mean. You see, um, my parents were Hindus at one time. And so they became Christians because of me. All right? You see, I was born premature by about a couple of months and had to stay in the hospital. And in the process, I was getting sick. I was not improving. And I had some serious health complications, such so that the doctors gave up and sent me home with my parents and said, take him home. The most we can do is tell you, take him home and let him die with you at home. All right? Now, the thing that came out from this is that eventually somebody came by from the Adventist church and they told my mom after she tried everything else with every other religion. And mind you, I think I've been baptized or Christianed in every single faith or denomination because my mom tried everything. So I, I belong everywhere. All right? <laughs> I just don't have the certificates to prove it. <laughs> um, however, um, so my mom took me to the Seventh Adventist Church in my sick condition. By, mind you, I'm two years old. I'm not able to walk or talk because of my health challenges. And so I got offered up or dedicated as a baby in church. And one week after that, my health complications went away. And so my mom and my dad became seven Adventists because of that. So she always told me, now, that's, not the, that's not the part of the story I want you to get now. She always told me, I've dedicated you to God just as how Samuel was dedicated by Hannah. 
And I always try to figure out what this means because she kept repeating it to me years and years and years after that. Even in my 20s and 30s, she'd still repeat it to me. But I'll tell you, back then when I was an elder, I thought that, oh, wait, uh, I must be better than everybody else. Because this is the part I wanted to get. All right? The spiritual days that I found myself in. And so I found myself speaking to the congregation as though I was superior. And that can be a dangerous thing. When you take the blessings of God and make it look as though I'm better than so and so person who has the same problem and they're suffering more than me. God hasn't healed them yet. And so that's the spiritual days I, I found myself in. And because of that, other things creeped in into my mind. Because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to become judgmental. I'm going to be proud. And so God had to bring me to my knees to take that away from me. Because I needed to lose those feelings, those attitudes, in order to be effective as a leader. And so I remember at one time when he took everything away from me. That's another experience by itself. I lost everything. My job. I lost my freedom. I had no money. And the only thing I had was a Bible. And so I went in search because I questioned God. I was like, God, how could you do this to me after knowing that I've been dedicated to you. Is that what you do to dedicated people? There was a crisis in our home that lasted quite a number of years that we had to endure for this. But through the process, I wanted to find God. And so I went in search. And I read my Bible throughout And as I read and I read, I came upon a few verses, and I just want to share them with you because these are critical to my experience now. One, Matthew 7, verses 3 to 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? That's me. And how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck of your eye out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I took that to heart. There's another one I took to heart. And this is from our scripture, and we're going to go back to John 9 later in a little bit. But It says, for Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. And I was like, God, I'm still trying to develop this relationship with you. And it's like, I'm not not feeling anything. I felt cold during that time. Because, see, in my mind, a relationship with God involves just more than what my mind tells me. And you can read God's God's word. And that's all you get sometimes. Well, God is kind. And he's all powerful. And he's all knowledgeable. What does does that do for me personally? It just tells me some characteristics of God. But what's in that for the relationship? That doesn't tell me anything or draws me into a relationship with him. I do not know God just from knowing those things. And you see, I could have preached sermons upon sermons on those things, on, on the attributes of God... But did I really bring anybody closer to God? Just talking about his attributes? I know who the, I, I've seen the president of our United States, all of them during my lifetime. And I can just tell you what they are, but do, do I have a relationship with them? No, I don't feel close to them at all. 
yeah, I know what, what, their, what authority they have. And that's what we, we tend to look at God as, what authority he has. But there's more to it than that in your relationship, in getting to know God. And so I wanted more. And so when I tell you I was in a spiritual daze, this is what I mean. All I knew was what he had a power and authority to do. And I wanted more than that. And I wasn't getting it. And so God had to take things away from me. And in taking all these things away from me and leaving me with a Bible and a Bible only, I had to find him. And so I went in search of this, in the scripture. I'm like, well, if I can't see angels and I can't see anything around me, then the only thing I could gain understanding from is God's word. And so I went there. And so I asked him, when I read this text, why does I feel blind? Am I the one that you're going to judge and say you pretended you could see, but I'm going to make you blind? Then why are you keeping me blind? And I prayed and I prayed and I talked to him. I said, well, you're not, you're not talking back to me. And so I kept praying and I kept reading. And every time I read the Bible, I started to see something new. Because here's what I started to look for. You see, I stopped looking for attributes of God because I knew them already. I wanted the nitty gritty things about God's personality. What does he like? What it is he doesn't like? I want to know when I do something he likes, how does he behave? When I do something he does not like, how does he behave? And would he still love me in the process? And I went in search of knowing God, knowing those are the things I'm looking for. Because those are the things that are relationship concepts to me. All right? When I have a friend, when I have a child, when I have a parent, those are the things, the personality that I look for. All right? It's because of their behavior, their attitude towards me that draws them to me. And that is the attitude I want to have when I'm searching for God. And then the other thing that drew me to my knees was Revelation 3, verses 14 to 18. And this God is talking to the last day church of Laodicea. And we know that is in our time. And it says to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Like some of us may be tempted. Yeah, God provides for me. I got everything. It's like that same statement. But you do not realize that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me, gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salves to put on your eyes so that you can see. And so those are the things that turn my life around. There's quite a bit more. All right? But I want us to focus now on our scripture text and the context it was written in. All right? And so it starts off in John chapter 9. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Well, obviously it couldn't be the man who sinned. Because if he was born blind, the man didn't do anything to cause his blindness. And that just tells you the attitude of the disciples. All right? They can see with their own eyes. 
And so the reason they're able to see is because they don't have the sin that that blind man has. All right? And so Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And all this brings us to the other concept now. Sin may not be the reason why someone is in a place that they are. You know, it's easy to think when you're, in a hard, you're suffering hard times because of a sin you've committed. You look at someone else. Well, sometimes it may be the sin they've committed. I mean, you got AIDS because of some immorality thing. All right? But for some reason, you got a stroke. All right? And you can't trace it to any dietary problem. And here you got the stroke. In your 20s or 30s, while being healthy, while being athletic. What, what's the sin there? And so it's easy to, to look at someone and say, well, sin caused that. Yeah, sin does cause it, but not that person's sin sometimes. All right? And so Jesus is saying, I'm about to reveal something. And that is what I want you to focus on today. I'm about to reveal the works of God here today. All right? And so in God's plan, that was the whole reasoning for it. Not that God wanted this man to be blind for how many years it was, but God knew that he's going to take this opportunity to, to reveal what he can do. And so it continues, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so it's critical here that Jesus is talking about light. He's the light and somebody who's going to be healed from blindness. Because you know if you're blind, you can't see the light. All right? And so he's saying, I am the light. I am what is going to give you the sight to make everything visible once more. And so when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated scent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. Why did Jesus have to heal in this manner? Sounds like a gross thing to do. All right? But here's the thing. I'm not looking at the grossness of it. You know what I see here? I see here the creator. The creator is using clay once more. At the creation of man, he used clay to create man and woman. He's using it again here to create sight. It could be that the man's eyeballs were not formed. And so he's creating a new eyeball in the process. In my mind's eye, I'm picturing all of this. It doesn't tell us how he was blind. Probably bad lens. Couldn't be glaucoma because he was born that way. All right? So it could have been a problem with the eyeball or something else. And so God needed to create a new eye for him. And so that's why I see the creator. And I don't look at how gross it is. However, what I want us to focus in the next few verses are the number of people around this man who are also blind. So it continues. Therefore, the neighbors, and these are the, our first set of blind people. Their neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this who, he, who sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But the man said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He answered and said, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. The next verse 
says they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. And we're going to stop there a little bit. Why did they have to carry him to the Pharisees? It's because they were blind themselves. They couldn't see the works of God and leave it as that. When God healed this man, start rejoicing. But no, in their doubting, wondering if this is the man that we knew before, because he certainly looks different. All right? Or is he not? We don't know. And so this is the thing with us sometimes. Sometimes God transforms somebody, but all you want to focus is, is that the blind man? Is that the man we knew? Because that's all I know. I don't want to look at the newness of this man. Let's just go back to the old things we know about them. And so this is one thing that we got to be careful as neighbors of somebody whose God has worked a miracle on. What are you going to focus on? On the way they used to be? How they used to cuss you out? Beat up on their wives or beat up on their husbands? Or the alcoholics? Or the immoral practices? Are we going to focus on that that we once knew? Or are we going to focus on the new person? And do we still need reassurance that this is real? That you've got to take and get an, another opinion? And so I see blind neighbors here. And so now let's continue. They brought him who, who was blind to the Pharisees. And so it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened this man's eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him? Because he opened our eyes. He opened your eyes. He said, he's a prophet. So now there's controversy among the Pharisees. Some of them are thinking, yeah, God worked a miracle here through Jesus. And some are doubting the works of Jesus. All right? And so as leaders uh, in, the, in God's church back then, what's going to happen? Some are being swayed. But eventually, among the Pharisees, they're going to decide that Jesus needs to be gotten rid of. I don't know how much of these who thought that this is Jesus, the Son of God, would have decided, uh, let's get rid of him. Okay? But the Pharisees are blind. Instead of dwelling on the sight of the man and the healing, what they're focusing now is, oh, Jesus did it on the Sabbath. The creator who is Lord of the Sabbath... And the creator who created Sabbath, not for himself, but for man, is now being told what he should and shouldn't do on the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees are going to get themselves into trouble. Because mentally, they're so blind. And so there's going to be some more disbelief. And it says, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. So now they're even doubting that this man was ever blind before. And so they called the parents of him who had received his sight, and they asked them, saying, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Notice some compromise going on here with the parents. They were worried that they would be excommunicated from the church. Back then, church 
taught them that if you're a member, that's the only way you can be saved. But if you were to leave the church, or we were to put you out from the church, there's no way you can be saved. And that's wrong. All right? God has been saving people even when churches were not in existence. Church denominations only came about the last few hundred years. Before that, there was not church denominations. People met at home, just as the disciples were told to do when you read the book of Acts and Romans and throughout the New Testament. People met at people's homes and they worshiped God there in small groups. And so this teaching of you can only be saved while being a member is not biblical. All right? Churches have a function. Yeah, we can pool resources, we can draw people in, but churches are, are not, whereas they guide people who come in to a relationship with heaven, but they're not the absolute avenue to God. And so, again, they call on the man who was blind and said to him, Give glory to God. Notice what they're saying now. They're saying we give you another chance. Don't talk about this Jesus. Talk about God. Say God healed you and not Jesus. That's what they're saying. It says give the glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He already told them this. And so he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? So all of a sudden, the healed man becomes bold. He becomes a preacher now. All right? And this is what the goodness of God does to you. When God moves within you, and you can feel that movement within your soul. You can't help but talk. Somehow their boldness comes out. And it's with that boldness he's able to stand up to the Pharisees. You see, he, whereas his parents are thinking, we don't want to be excommunicated from the synagogue, he doesn't mind because he knows his Savior. And it's not based on what his parents believe or what any other leader tell him. This is his experience. And that's what he's going to move and live with. And so then they reviled him and said, You are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. And so the man answered and said to them, again in more boldness, Why? This is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. So he's acknowledging them. He's saying, I know God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard off that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. And so if this man were from God, he could do nothing. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins. And are you teaching us? And so they cast him out. You see, when the words of someone who's weak, who's considered weak, and lowly, and a nobody, and they've had an experience with God, it confounds everybody else. It confounds the learned. And that is what was happening here. And it comes a time when the learned will, will either accept that that is from God, or find another reason to reject it. It just so happened they're going to use the Sabbath as their basis for rejection. A poor excuse of a reason to the Almighty God who created the Sabbath, who is not bound by the laws of the Sabbath because there's nothing that He can do that would break the Sabbath. 
He said, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh is the Sabbath of the Lord. Well, it's of the Lord. That's his Sabbath. He can do what he wants. And there's nothing he does that's considered work in our eyes. Because he does not labor for things that would benefit him. Even the work he does on the Sabbath day is not for his benefit. It is for our benefit. And so that's the principle we, principle we need to get from the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of rest for us from benefiting from the works of our labor. But Sabbath is a day that God works much like normal. It just so happened that it's the same work he does every day of the week. God is still involved in, in, in saving people on a Sabbath day. He's still involved in mediating Jesus is mediating still. It does not mean that on Sabbath day he stops mediating for anybody and he doesn't hear prayers. God works just as hard on Sabbath as every other day of the week. And so Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when they found him, he said, and when he had found him, that's Jesus, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And so he answered and said, who is he, Lord? that I may believe in him. And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. So not only did the blind man receive physical sight, he was able to understand and see that he was now in the presence of God. In the presence of the Son of God, that's all he needed. And so Jesus, in culminating that story, um, turned to his disciples and said, For judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, If you are blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. So there were some disciples following Jesus. These are not the disciples that the man, the blind man went to. There were some disciples who were, there were some Pharisees who were also always following Jesus because they needed to carry back messages. All right? And so they asked him, are we blind? Well, a blind person knows that they're blind. They don't ask if they're blind. In other words, they're asking Jesus, do we fit into that category you just talked about, that there are some people who say they're seen and cannot see? That's what they're asking him. Are we in that category? And Jesus, in no other words, says yes. The fact that you're asking me that question, yes, you are a blind person that you can ask that. And so whenever you read God's scripture and he brings you to your knees, fall on it and pray. Take that relationship a little more serious. Okay? Um, and so there's just a few more scripture I want to share with you. Um, some of this we've, we've looked at at many times. Uh, one is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3, 12. No, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 16. Uh, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. It says, no, we're not like in Moses' time, in the old ancient times, where you'd have to put a veil on your face to talk to God. It's not like that anymore. We have a boldness now because of Jesus' sacrifice. And so their minds were made dull, but for this day, the same veil remains. That's the Old Testament when it's read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. So, so those who are still holding on to Moses' teaching with the Old Covenant, uh, that covenant is, is no longer applicable. All right? Because if you remember, the Old Covenant was that um, your descendants would be my people. And so it was, it was a blood generation of people and that that no longer is there all right 
and say it's, uh, it has now been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. In other words, turn to God and you can see. All right? Uh, Ephesians 5, 8 says, For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are in the light of God. Walk as children of light. And then there's one more I want to share with you. This is my last text from Joel 2, verses 28 to 29. It says afterward, and this is talking about an end time event. All right? And it hasn't happened yet. It says afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now that's different. We, when we read the book of Acts, we talk about the disciples, all right? Who's more than 12 of them? Because there's a few others with them, and all of them were filled with God's Spirit. And so they went about preaching and talking in, in various languages. Well, here in Joel, it's predicting that coming to the end of time, just before Jesus comes, all God's people are going to be filled with the Spirit. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And what by, by that I mean... All your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. It's one of the things I look forward to, and I tell myself, just before Christ comes, this is what I'm going to see, and I'm expecting it. And so what I expect from my members every now and then is when they come back and say, I've had a dream of Jesus. Or I've seen things in vision. Now here's the thing. There's coming a time when that is going to be a reality among all God's people. The Bible also tells us that that will be a time of spiritual awakening in the world. Because when, God's, when other people who see that, that God's people are prophesying, they will be drawn and call and accept Jesus. It will be the last ditch method when you look at end time events. All right? Now, how do we take in all of this teaching now into our lives? Because when our eyes are open, we get a new focus. Here's what we see differently. Hard times comes, and what do we see? Do we focus on the hard times? Or do we focus on the fact that God has provisions and protections and directions in that? Can we feel God's presence? When God opens your eyes, you can see. You can realize. You can perceive differently. When there's conflicts in our relationship with, at work, at home, wherever, what do we focus on? Remember, we've just dealt with Ephesians. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. The fact that you're having a conflict with someone, your eyes are open now. Well, I'm not supposed to wrestle with you. I'm going to wrestle with God. Let him take care of whatever spiritual condition is causing this. And so i got to always focus in this new outlook on life that I've received. The veil has moved God has opened my eyes, I can see. There's spiritual forces at work in everything. And just as how I am battling with this side of flesh and a side of the spirit that I've been born again into, i got to see that in everybody else. It just so happens in church, the side of the spirit in you all are much larger and more dominant than the side of this flesh. But out in the world when I walk the streets, I don't expect that balance. I may see the side of the flesh more dominant over the side of the spirit, or probably no spirit at all. And so I got to always tell myself, I can see differently. I do not take things personally when you, when you have a conflict. I just leave that alone without exaggerating it, without uh, escalating it. And I take that to God. That's his problem. I do not wrestle with flesh and blood. All right? When you can see, those are the things that happen. Uh, I was watching the news there with, between Israel and the Gaza and the Palestinians. And saw one man being interviewed. He was happy 
when they told him his child was dead. And he actually said it. Why? Because if Hamas had taken the child over there in captivity, worse would have happened. The torture, the hunger, and whatever else they do to the spoils of war. He didn't want that to happen to his child. So he was happy that his child died. Now here's the thing. We know that it is coming a time of trouble that the world hasn't seen. And so with new eyes, this is what I see. And I want to share it with you. When this, what you've seen right now in war, happens here, and it's not going to be a war with country against us, but where citizens are at war with citizens here, because that's the trouble we expect. Okay? The trouble where you're not conforming to a spiritual ideology that we want to emphasize here in our country. And what happens then? When you're taken captive, it says there's a time of trouble that we haven't seen. What would happen to you? Uh, Jesus talked about the time for the 80, 70, when Jerusalem would be destroyed. And he says... He talked about the pregnant woman and fleeing and hope that it doesn't happen to them or to the children. Well, I pray that doesn't happen to any one of us here, but it's going to happen. But here's the thing that I'm seeing. I don't know if you're noticing it, but a lot of our seniors are dying on us. And I say, thank God, because looking at the political framework that's happening now and the people who are bold that wants to make the United States into a religiously ruled country, it's going to happen, I feel, within my lifetime. Somehow, it's awakening me that sight to see this can happen now. And so I'm happy to know that my seniors are not going to experience this. And so don't be so sorrowful and hopeless when we start to see these things happening. Because it started already. All right? Having eyes to see makes you realize what is happening right before you. And so when you walk down the street with eyes to see, when you look at people, you see children of God. You don't look at them as strangers anymore. All right? You look at them as children of God. Some who may know God and some who don't. And you never form this preconceived idea, well, the tattoo on them uh, means that oh, they're not a follower of God. But that's not true. Or the hemline determines if they're a follower of God or not. That's not true either. All right? They're still all children of God. And so you, when you look at them, you don't form preconceived ideas. Except the one that this is a child of God who needs saving or may not need saving. You just don't know because you don't know who the Christians are when you sit on the airplane or in, or in a taxi car or on the bus. Right. You just don't know unless they start talking. Amen. Having eyes to see does another thing for us. It makes us brave and bold. We don't care what happens. We don't fear anything. We don't fear men, just as this blind man wasn't fearful of the Pharisees or his excommunication. We don't fear anybody. We don't fear any situations. And so boldly, we take it. I can endure this because God is with me. I have his protection. I have his provisions. And finally, I want to encourage us with this one thought. Don't take the blessings of God and make it as though I am now superior to everybody else. God has a way of blessing people. And you can use that same blessing and it can be your downfall. Amen. I used it at one time, believe me. All right? I don't anymore. And so, 
God wants us to open up, wants us to have eyes that are open to everything. And I pray that God's blessing would be upon each one of us. And so at this time, uh, we, we're going to pray. Let's stand and pray. If you want your eyes to be open, please. Um, you can be in that daze, like I once experienced, and you can come out of it. You just have to want to come out of that days. If you don't feel that closeness, uh, just know you're in that spiritual days that I experienced. However, if you do feel close, you can get even closer. And so may God protect you and keep you. And so at this time, dear Father, be with your members here today. Take care of us. Give us eyes to see. Help us to realize what's happening in the world around us. Help us to see what's happening in our own hearts and in our own lives. Forgive us, dear God, and bless us, I pray. Thank you for your love and kindness. Thank you for your tender mercies. Thank you, God, for being our God and being present with us always. Forgive us where we've gone wrong. And may your spirit dwell with us, within us continually, I pray. Amen.